Picking up the pieces of an Indiana tragedy, like the bones left behind by a suspected killer who never faced justice. Charred, broken, buried, discarded. More than 20 suspected homosexuals have died violent deaths. Authorities believe all of the victims frequented gay bars here in Indianapolis. If they murder one person, they're not going to stop. It almost appears Mr. Baumeister was leaving a double life. The suspected crimes of Herbert Baumeister made news for more than 15 years before his name was officially tied to the murders of 17 identified men and boys. This is most likely the largest mass murder, at least in this state, if not in the Midwest. 10,000 bone fragments unearthed on Baumeister's former property, Fox Hollow Farm in Westfield. These people were placed on a shelf for 26 years and they were forgotten, and they're no longer forgotten. Now, a new effort to identify the nameless victims. I want to give as many people the closure that they deserve as well. To understand why the extent of Herbert Baumeister's cruelty remains a mystery, you'll hear from some of the people who were closest to the case. Two women whose families were forever changed when their brothers disappeared. We talked about every day, and Manuel wasn't calling. My brother was young and he was innocent, you know. He was an innocent kid no matter his lifestyle. A private investigator who listened to the stories and fears of a group thought by some to be on the fringes of society. We found out real quick that there were a lot of missing people, a lot of missing gay people in Indianapolis. A man who saw his friends disappear as a killer preyed on his community. It is part of our gay history. It's a, it's a horrible chapter and not something to just flip the pages and gloss over and go on. Two former prosecutors who can now look back on the case and its abrupt ending. And he knew we had the evidence. He knew what was out there. He knew that people were out digging up his backyard. How could this have happened in our community? How could it have gone on for so long and involved so many people without uh, somebody catching on sooner? Hundreds of pages of documents paint a picture of an investigation into a man's double life. And reporting from the WRTV archive shows frustration and fear as murders and disappearances remained unsolved. There seems to be somebody that's attacking our community. This is just the most blatant act of violence against our community. Sometimes we must return to the past to give it a name. It doesn't matter what their lifestyle was, who they were in life, how much money they did or didn't have. They deserve to have that final resting place. History is still being written today. They talk about Dahmer. They talk about everybody still to this day on the Internet. So, yeah, I think people need to know that there was this serial killer. <laughs> Stories like this are never truly over, and the next chapter of this story begins in November of 2022. Jeff Jellison is elected Hamilton County Coroner and wastes no time spreading the word about a major mission for his office and scientists across the state. Whilst that I was presented the opportunity to lead this initiative, I believe I was put in a place to do that. The reason I'm doing this is to give closure. But you also got to understand, I've got a statutory duty to do it. My job, by statute, says that the coroner is responsible to identify the deceased in this county. I do what I do as a forensic anthropologist out of respect for the decedents. That's my obligation, is to be able to provide them a voice when they no longer have one. The bones have remained in storage at the University of Indianapolis since being found. Jellison hopes new technology can help them identify more victims. 1996, DNA was relatively new, especially at the local law enforcement level. The coroner's office decided to organize a group of experts that might be able to address some of the challenges surrounding this particular case. Many of the fragments were burned and were exposed to the environment for extended periods of time. We have 10,000 remains right now on our hands. We need to get those to laboratories. I believe there's as many as 25 or more people 
that are represented in those remains. And understand, some of those remains are as small as a fingernail. I am driven to identify those remains, to provide those people, because that's what those, those remains are. They are people. They're someone's brother, someone's son, potentially someone's husband, and they're sitting on a shelf at a university in a box or in plastic bags or however they're stored. And those folks deserve the opportunity to a final resting place. They either weren't reported missing or there's not family reference samples on file, or we just don't have the information we need in order to identify them. And we look at them as being almost forgotten in life and being forgotten in death. If you have someone missing, please let us know. We'll get a DNA swab from you. We'll get that entered into the missing person database. So now when we start testing those bones or developing DNA samples from those bones, we've got something to compare it to. I wondered, and I got the horrible news. It's worse, in my opinion, to wonder, because you don't know. If you get your brother or your son's ashes back, uh, at least you got something there if you want to go to a special spot and talk to them. You can't if you don't know where he is. I don't wish that on nobody. I mean, at least we had some form of closure that we had something. They never had anything, so I'm sure they're wondering, waiting for them to walk in the door, probably still today, you know, like I did. And that's tough. My name is Debbie Falls. I grew up in the southeast side of Indianapolis on Bradbury. It was a good time. You know, uh, you thought you could trust people a lot more than today. We call him Richie. Yeah, his name is Richard Douglas. I think I was like 17 when he went missing. He was um, eccentric a little bit, you know. He was really smart. Uh, he was real tall, you know, real long arms, real long legs. And um, he was just everybody's friend, you know. He wanted a place to fit in, you know, because he was so tall and so blinky. You could pick any word out of the dictionary and he would spell it forward and backwards. I mean, he was, he was smart. He was a little different. He would stand up for people and he loved people, you know. He was just really a genuine, good, good soul. I miss his voice. I could still hear him. And he was funny. Manuel Resendez. He was just a really, really nice, kind person. Manuel, he's number 10, I'm number 11, and 16 kids. And he's the first one in our family to graduate. And Manuel just decided, and he went out there and he worked his butt off and he got his own senior pictures. He played every instrument. He started out with the cornet and went to the clarinet, saxophone, flute. He played the music. He hung with this child. That was his little buddy. And they did a lot of stuff together. He's got a granddaughter now that he never met. And he got things going for himself. He, and, and he was the first. He was the first in our family every time. It didn't matter what it was. Good stuff. For as young as he was, for the little life that he did have, he was a good person. I knew that, you know, he wanted to get married, you know, and I know he had a girlfriend. He never came to me and said, I'm gay or I'm bisexual or I'm any of anything. You know, he never came out to any of us about any of that. It was many years that went by that we had no idea what even happened, you know. We were searching for him. I'm really not sure how he ended up where he was when Herbert Baumeister found him. He worked at a, um, like a group home or something like that in Lafayette. He was kind to those kids. He helped those kids and he did everything he could for them. And he came up missing, okay? And people were upset because a gay guy was working at a boy's home. He didn't keep it a secret and 
they loved him there at work and people were upset not even even thinking about the fact that he was the victim the 1990s a decade when there was a push and pull to tolerate and accept homosexuality on one hand some people embraced the idea and fought for rights on the other so many resisted it Gays and lesbians say they're making history by celebrating their homosexuality, and they look forward to the day of acceptance. We are a minority, and we need to stand up, and we have rights, we have love, just like anybody else, and people want to put us down for it, and they don't understand it till they walk in our shoes. It was a time when roughly a dozen gay bars and clubs in Indianapolis provided a sanctuary and a sense of community. My name is Derek Terriak. I'm the co-owner of Greg's. It would always be jam-packed, the music was so loud, and it was just so much energy. The place opened in 1980 on 16th Street. Before it became Greg's, it was known as Our Place, OPs for short. It was just a place for the gay community. It was just everything you want it to be. A place needed in a time when people were attacked for being gay. If somebody goes up and says, hey, queer, and then hits them, they're going to get a stiffer penalty. Now, there's something wrong with that kind of legislation. Those people choose that lifestyle. They can keep it to themselves. They don't need to be promoted to the public. You, you didn't want to be known. You, you could lose your job like that, or family would be disowned. We wanted our identity kept secret. It was very difficult. But even in these safe spaces, there was danger. OP's was one of several places from where investigators say Herbert Baumeister lured his victims. According to police investigators, Herbert Baumeister led a double life, but his secret life began to emerge from a growing list of missing men. He went with two friends and they were together until Manuel left and that was around midnight the last time they seen him you never think it's going to happen to your family you know i i know i didn't we've had uh, approximately seven or eight uh, missing people that came through with some commonalities my sister called as she was like manuel's missing i said give him a minute let him get home but he was supposed to come over to see mom he never did then it set in He'd already made plans with my mom, and he always followed through. When this happened, we were shocked. We were like, what the hell's going on? But Richie has been known also to hitchhike all the way to California. Come Monday, when we went over there to the police station, uh, I knew, I knew Manuel was gone. He would never, ever just leave and not tell somebody. According to police, all of the missing victims have several traits in common, chief among them, alternative lifestyles. We don't want to think something bad could have happened because we didn't know about the boogeyman, mm -hmm. you know? There was nothing like that around our town, even in Indianapolis, you know? No serial killers. <laughs> One of the things that we were looking at when we looked at all these commonalities uh, was the possibility that there was uh, someone or several someones who were working uh, together, uh, perhaps eliminating uh, these people from the community. That whole scenario, the whole thing with him, we had the AIDS crisis going on. So you had to think, uh, is this person missing because something's really happening? Or is this person gone because of the AIDS epidemic, and no one wants to say why they really are no longer with us. AIDS spread rapidly among men in the late 1980s and early 1990s. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, by 1994, AIDS became the leading cause of death for all Americans ages 25 to 44, surpassing car accidents, heart disease, and homicide. By Halloween the following year, the U.S. reaches a grim milestone a half million reported cases of AIDS in this country. The toll the disease takes on the body is clearly evident among those withering from the deadly virus. Many victims battling AIDS 
fell away from social scenes, and even retreated from those closest to them. You had two things going on at the exact same time. It created a lot of confusion, so was it just rumor? You had to think, that's just rumor. I'm not ashamed that he's gay. That's one of the, the questions that they asked me and my sister was telling me in Spanish, don't tell him. She was saying in Spanish, don't, don't say anything about that, just tell him, you know, uh, to look for him. And I said, yes, he is. And she told me later, she was like, they're not gonna look for him as hard, which made me feel really bad because I, I didn't get what she was saying to me. I didn't. There was frustration. Um, we as a gay community just accepted it, which we shouldn't have, but it is a totally different time. We never heard from him. You know, it was like months went by and nothing. We had, you know, no, no cell phones, uh, no paper trail. We didn't know that he frequent any places. Uh, we didn't really know his newfound friends. My mom was just walking around with her, uh, her heart. I mean, she was literally bent over, her heart was so heavy, and she didn't know that the rest of her kids were there because she was looking for the one. It was just one of the most horrific, saddest things that I have ever watched and lived. You think you just call the police and they go out and find them. You know, that's what, you know, that's what you think. You know, we didn't think about hiring a detective or a private investigator. To find their missing loved ones, the families of two other missing Indianapolis men turned to Virgil Vandegrift. After 25 years with the Marion County Sheriff's Office, Vandegrift started his own private detective agency. Along with a half dozen employees, Vandegrift got to work. They decided that uh, we needed to get one of posters made up and get them out to the community as fast as we could. And he really dug deep to try to help us with this situation. It was, it was awesome. Former Hamilton County Prosecutor Sonia Learcamp had been in office less than a year when bones were discovered on her Baumeister's property. Learcamp and former Deputy Prosecutor Kathleen Clark say Vandegrift played a key role in the early days of the case. Having an independent investigator, especially one that other investigators know and trust um, is, is a fantastic thing to have in an investigation. I felt like there, there was a serial killer involved. And with that, I put together a profile of what I thought the person would be like that we would be looking for. A lot of the victims were estranged from their families. It wasn't unusual for a lot of them to drop off the family radar for long periods of time. So a lot of these victims, I think, went unnoticed for a while. Serial killers sometimes pick on um, not just gay communities, but example, prostitutes or uh, people along those lines that society itself um, doesn't pay a lot of attention to when they come up missing. They may have been reported missing, but no, it wouldn't have crossed their mind that somebody in Hamilton County would have taken them up to their home and uh, perpetrated this kind of crime. It was just a matter of uh, zeroing in on who. He was very strange. I don't know what part of them they saw, but I saw a different man. How does that even happen? Like the guy that just murdered your brother or found to murder him is right here and I've been working for him this whole time. That's weird. Still to come, what Debbie Falls remembers to this day about the hours she spent with the man later connected to her brother's death and how a would-be victim helped detectives crack the case after surviving a night with her Baumeister.
justice with uh, the other notorious serial, serial killers that we've read about, um, he was very good at hiding who he really was. Investigators know that Bomeister played one role of husband, father, and businessman. But investigators say Bomeister also frequented every gay bar in the city, often taking men back to his sprawling estate. Even the way he lived um, and the business he ran uh, con contributed to his ability to hide what he was doing. Him and his wife um, ran a business. It was a non-for-profit, non it was supposed to be. I worked for him. I was an employee at the Save-A-Lot thrift store. I sorted through all the clothing and that went out on the front like Goodwill to sell on Washington Street in Indianapolis. My brother was missing at the time. There was nothing fancy. He wasn't distinguished. He was not even verbally um, communicative. He would sit back there with me and sort through those clothes and not say a word to me. I took a paycheck from this man. He killed my brother. Um, he could have killed me if he would have known if that maybe I put an inkling to it. I don't know what his pickup line was, but evidently it was very good because he managed to get several people and that it took that long. What was his character to give off to, to lure these individuals, these young men, for a ride uh, or anything, or come party with me or hang out with me? What did he say? How did you manage to do that? How did he convince them? I would love to know more. There's a lot of unanswered questions. It is the summer of 1994. Over the last year or so, at least nine men have disappeared from Indianapolis. Virgil Vandegrift and his team are working the case. I realized then we needed to step up the investigation. We did come by an informant that had been with, uh, at the time, the suspect, uh, and went to his house with him, spent an evening with him. Baumeister had attracted the attention of Indianapolis police. An informant told them he met Baumeister at a downtown bar and then later went to Baumeister's residence. In a conversation with Hamilton County investigators in July of 1996, Mark Goodyear describes going to Fox Hollow Farm about two years earlier with the man who introduced himself as Brian. Brian told Goodyear the estate belonged to his boss. Goodyear tells investigators they discussed bondage, fetishes, and erotic asphyxiation, a form of choking as a sexual act. While there, they had an encounter in the swimming pool where the survivor was in the pool, and Mr. Baumeister came up behind him and, and placed a pool hose around his neck. While talking to Hamilton County investigators, Goodyear says the man known as Brian pointed out how easily an accident could happen. In his own words, Goodyear says the indoor pool area was set up for an encounter that night. He had everything ready. He was planning on bringing somebody back to the house that night. If it hadn't been me, it would have been somebody else. Eventually, Goodyear says Brian fell asleep while he explored a home that he describes as dusty, hardly lived in, and covered in cobwebs. Goodyear tells investigators, I do believe that if I had been severely under the influence that he probably would have went further with me. And if there's a bent human being, that's it. That's one right there. The next morning, Goodyear says he was taken back to where they met. Herbie ended up bringing him back to Indianapolis and letting him out, letting him go. Overall, I think he was terrified by what happened to him. Mark Goodyear coming forward was huge because we needed to have that person who could at least circumstantially put him as a possible perpetrator. It shouldn't have had to fall to a, a potential victim to do the investigation. There's some unfairness in that. 
Mark Goodyear first shared his story with law enforcement in August of 1994. He knew an Indianapolis police detective named Mary Wilson was investigating the disappearance of gay men. Many of the people we spoke with about the Ballmeister case consider Mary Wilson a hero. Today, she's retired and no longer speaks about the case. Her daughter says that's out of respect for the victims and the bonds Wilson formed with their families throughout the investigation. A memo Wilson wrote to her IPD supervisors in June of 1996 goes into detail about all the work she did on the case. She and Mark Goodyear spent months trying to locate the property where he spent a night with the man known as Brian, but they never found it. All the while, Goodyear says he was trying to figure out who Brian really was. It took some help from his friends in the summer of 1995. Herb came into the gay bar he was in. He jumped up on one of the tables and yelled out, this guy's a serial killer, somebody get his license plate number. If we hadn't had that, there wouldn't have been any way to link him because, you know, the physical evidence is pretty much gone. And of course, we traced the license plate number and it came back to Herb Baumeister. And then the dominoes kind of started falling. With that key piece of information, Detective Mary Wilson focused her investigation on Baumeister, his family, his property, and his business. Wilson says she approached her Baumeister at his business and told his wife, Julie, Mark Goodyear's story. But Julie insisted it was all lies. Neither would consent to a search of Fox Hollow Farm. Police say Baumeister refused to let them search his home and property, and investigators say they lacked evidence to obtain a search warrant. That's until Detective Wilson got a call from Julie Baumeister's attorney. If anyone at this stage of the game is a victim, I think it would be his wife and his family. She had a story to share. Court records show that Juliana Bomeister contacted police through her attorney last Monday and took them to a section of her property where in December of 1994 she had observed possible human remains, including a skull and bones. Investigators say the Baumeister's son and a friend found the skull while playing in the woods near their home. Investigators say her husband claimed the skull had once belonged to his physician father, took the skull, and Mrs. Bomeister and her children never saw it again. Detective Mary Wilson returned to the location of that disturbing discovery and found human bones and teeth. It was enough to obtain a search warrant almost two years after Mark Goodyear first shared his story about Fox Hollow Farm. It didn't really hit me like how big a story this was going to be. I worked at a satellite office for the Star up in Hamilton County. I just remember this one day getting a report that human remains were being um, uncovered at this estate in Westfield. For the past five days, the scientists and the sheriff's deputies have worked side by side, excavating a location that now spans two different properties along 156th Street. When I made that picture, it was shot with a long telephoto lens. I, remember seeing the woman pull up what looked like a, you know, a femur or a bone in her hand. And autopilot took over and I was just shooting. And it didn't really sink into me how macabre the scene was until I was editing negatives. And it kind of hit me like, wow, this is crazy. The investigation has recovered more than 150 bone fragments. Still, investigators have not revised upward their estimate of the number of bodies the site may eventually hold. Personally, what went through my mind is, you know, there are monst monsters out there, I guess. You know, you hear about serial killers, and here we had one right up here in Westfield. The search for bones and bodies has drawn interest from police agencies from across the state and the country. It involved the forensic anthropologist right away, and uh, it was a well-done investigation. It was busy. There were a lot of people. There was some notoriety about it in the legal community. And so there were law enforcement officers, maybe not even people who necessarily were doing anything, but people were out talking. And I mean, I did a lot of standing around. You know, we're out there waiting to see what happens. And like I said, it was hot and buggy. And, um, but we had been out there for a while when, you know, we learned of this creek bed. And so that kind of changed like the whole trajectory 
and expanded what we were doing. In and among the massive bone fragments, scientists and sheriff's investigators uncovered a pair of handcuffs. While refusing to comment on the significance of the find, it clearly excited the excavation crew, who displayed them like some trophy fish. The handcuffs could yield fingerprints or shed some light on what may have happened to the victims before, during, and after their deaths. The more we got uh, forensic archaeologists involved in helping us, uh, the more bodies came to light. And, um, and it was just a shocking situation. 10,000 bones and bone fragments were recovered in that initial excavation. So most of those bones and bone fragments are not any bigger than a thumbnail. Um, so how many people does that represent? I don't know that we'll ever have the answer to that, but when you consider the amount of remains recovered, it's really a debris field larger than most mass fatalities. Uh, something maybe even larger than some plane crashes. The search of the farm, which Hamilton County authorities have conducted over the past 10 days, Indianapolis police wanted to do last fall. But they say Bomeister refused to be interviewed or to let them search his property. Everything happened so quickly. The search warrant was served on the property, remains were found. Uh, and then just very soon after that, uh, Mr. Baumeister committed suicide. There was no APB, there was no BOLO, there was nothing put out for him. You know, they just let him go. And he went to Canada and he robbed everybody of justice. have yielded more bones and more bodies. This latest discovery only deepens the mystery about the identity of the victims and the reasons why they never made it out of this gently rolling estate in Hamilton County. I would consider it bizarre. I mean, you know, we're finding human bones. Uh, it's not at a grave site. Police had found the remains of five unidentified people, spent shotgun shells and handcuffs when Bowmeister was found shot to death in Canada. Police confirm he left behind a four-page suicide note, but that may not solve the mystery. I have not heard anything that would suggest it deals with any of the disappearances or, or the fines that they've made on that property. Chicken shit is the word that comes to mind, and I know that's not very proper, but, um, you know, he spent a lot of time and a lot of effort and used his intelligence to accomplish um, what he sought to do, as evil as it was, and then in the end can't even face what he did. Chicken The piece of that that I am most unsettled with is it just seems that when Baumeister died, Shortly after that, everything came to a stop. Would it have stopped if it had been eight blonde-haired, blue-eyed, 16-year-old girls from Carmel? Everything he's done points to his his guilt. And, and everything he's done, I mean, you know, the things he did to conceal the crimes, the, the way he dealt with his family, uh, the way he dealt with law enforcement. All of those things add up to his guilt. A guy like that, it just seems like it was compulsive with him. Uh, I don't know if he just, he might have stopped for a while, um, but he probably would have just, if he hadn't killed himself, he probably would have at least gone underground. Everyone was pretty sure that we weren't leaving some serial murderer on the loose, but it really left not a, no recourse for the family. It took days to unearth the bones, but it took months to identify the victims found on a rolling horse farm in southern Hamilton County. Baumeister's story had just popped in. It was breaking news, and I was sitting at the corner of the bed, and I swear on everything I love, that TV zoomed in. I mean, it just came to me while they were talking and stuff, and I knew my brother was in there. By the 
dates on them bones, you know, the estimated time of death, it, it wasn't long after he went missing that he was already gone. Sheriff's investigators identified four victims, all young to middle-aged males. They include 23-year-old Richard D. Hamilton of Indianapolis, 35-year-old Manuel Resendez of Lafayette, reported missing one week after Hamilton disappeared. August 11th of that year, they come knocking at my door and they told me that they had found him. Part of his jaw was found in, in those uh, remains that were found in Baumeister's um, property. And Baumeister had killed himself. Your brother's missing. The man that you're working for killed him. You know, um, you took a paycheck from him and it was just guilt. I mean, just so much absorption of guilt that I felt from that. I mean, it took years to find him, to find out what happened to him for the testing and then to get something back and have a service. It was years, years. I don't know if I could mentally take it if we didn't have something. I mean, all we had was a couple bone fragments, you know, and some teeth. He was buried in a baby casket. Yeah. I was pregnant with my daughter when we got to bury him. I don't know how to describe it. Horrible. And I know it had to be horrific for my mom. That was her baby. When Manuel disappeared, he took a big old chunk because, you know, she ended up dying in 94, where he disappeared in 93. So she ended up dying and she asked me while she was in the hospital, she asked me to, you know, she said, bring my gown and bring me some slippers. And I said, okay. She said, hey. And I said, why? She said, bring Manuel to me. I said, okay, mom, you want me to bring your slippers and your gown? And you want me to bring Manuel? I'll be here in the morning. And I turned around and I was like, I just started bawling because I, di I didn't, know how I was going to bring him. I knew where her gown and her slippers were, but, you know, she died that, later on that night, so she found him. Still unidentified, at least one or more bodies, and still unknown, a cause of death of each victim. Sheriff's investigators also want to know, too, if the person responsible for these deaths had any help. I still feel hollow from it, that there are these people out there who will never get it, um, their day in court. I mean, I learned early on that you don't get a lot necessarily from a verdict where someone's convicted, because it doesn't undo the crime. Nobody stayed with it. They just, okay, we got these bones. What are we gonna do, leave them there forever? And I really believe that, you know, they would have remained there without an effort. To this day, no one knows exactly how many people Herbert Baumeister killed, making it an even bigger challenge to identify his victims. His name might not be as recognizable as Dahmer or Gacy or people like that, but I think his actions certainly parallel, if not takes him to the forefront. He's in that league. He may be the quarterback of the team. Based on remains and reports of missing men, investigators believe Baumeister may be responsible for 25 deaths. But for 16 years, no one could connect him to the crimes. And for a time, he wasn't the only serial killer at work in the same part of the country targeting young gay men. In the past couple of years, at least a half dozen local men have been found dead in rural areas surrounding the city. One strangled, two stabbed, others with no determined cause of death. The bodies began turning up in 1980. Victims between 14 and 26 years old, strangled or stabbed, left in rural areas across the state. Local police quickly honed in on commonalities among the victims, leading to media coverage like this. For most, if not all of the murder victims, this time of night and these places in downtown Indianapolis were part of their lives. They were known hustlers, 
Young men and boys who walk these streets selling sexual favors for a price. Leaders in the gay community spoke out early about the way these victims were being portrayed. The focus was not on the tragedy of this boy's death, but the focus then became to identify what they claimed was the gay community. The media frequently um, either contributes to our invisibility or contributes to the notion that we are extraordinary in um, insofar as our lives are concerned. They tend to see us only in terms of our sexuality. In May of 1983, local police departments met with the FBI to compare notes on the murders. One of the methods they will use to try to link these cases is a technique known as psychological what that profiling. What involves is looking for psychological evidences of the base motivations of the perpetrators. Still, they couldn't officially determine whether the cases were connected. There uh, have been a couple of bodies, the method of uh, uh, of the uh, killing is different in several of the cases, so uh, the similarities really aren't that close. Frustrated, members of the gay community begged investigators to let them help. We have tried to do everything within our power to let them know, including sitting in meetings with them, that we are available, we are willing to help them on these cases, and to date, we have not been allowed to help in the least. We might be able to uh, educate them towards uh, the gay community, and they might be overlooking clues because of their ignorance of how the gay community works. Then police got an early lead on another possible victim, 22-year-old Michael Riley. Saturday night, he partied with a friend at two Broad Ripple night spots, leaving the Vogue at 2.30 a.m. with a stranger who promised to give him a ride home. On this particular case here, there, there's something strange about it. Uh, after talking with the, with the parents, uh, this is not your normal, typical uh, runaway report or missing person or whatever. I hate to say it, but I, yeah, I think something happened to him. Or he'd be here, or he'd let me know where he's at. Eight days after he disappeared, Michael Riley's body was found in shallow water under a bridge in an isolated part of Hancock County. There were bruises on his neck. An autopsy later determined he had been strangled. I think any time you find this many victims in this short a period of time, you have to assume that they're related to some degree. By June of 1983, a task force representing investigators from nine counties, local police departments, and state police began digging deep into eight of the cases. But investigators leave a strong impression that the task force will be operational for several months, if not a year, at least until all the leads have been exhausted or the murders have been solved. A tip led the task force to a man named Larry Eiler, originally from Crawfordsville. Eiler's arrest in Illinois for a similar murder there was secured mainly by the work of the Indiana investigators. But for their own cases, they have just circumstantial evidence. A lot of it, but still just circumstantial. The task force questioned him, but they had no grounds to hold him. So they had to release Eiler. Months later, Eiler was arrested again. August 21st, 1984, a young boy named Danny Bridges uh, is found in a dumpster behind the apartment where Larry Eiler lived. He was charged with the murder of Danny Bridges and then he was convicted and sentenced to death. With Larry Eiler in prison, the task force eventually ended. But the work of the serial killer known as the I-70 Strangler continued. By 1990, investigators in central Indiana and now Ohio are once again looking into the murders of men with ties to the gay community. Law enforcement officials hope that the latest murders do not stump them for as long or claim as many lives. For the record, dating back to 1985, five bodies have turned up in Ohio. The latest corpse remains unidentified. All the victims were strangled and all hailed from central Indiana. Authorities believe all of the victims frequented gay bars here in Indianapolis. In August of 1991, the last victim of the so-called I-70 Strangler was found. Herb Baumeister and his family moved from the northeast side of Indianapolis to Fox Hollow Farm five months later. The killings seemed to stop while men continued to disappear and eventually turned up somewhere else. Turned earth at the farm has turned up more than 150 bone fragments, some of them charred. Shotgun shells and a pair of handcuffs were also among the buried bones. The investigation will move from the farm to the laboratory, where scientists will need four to six weeks to identify the sex of the victims, 
to perhaps determine their cause of death and to bring some closure. The remains of 11 individuals were found at Fox Hollow Farm. Eight have been identified. Richard Hamilton, Manuel Resendez, Alan Wayne Broussard, Roger Allen Goodlett, Stephen Hale, Jeff Allen Jones, Johnny Bayer, and Michael Kieran. Three remain unidentified. This is an open population, meaning that there are some estimates of how many individuals went missing at that time, but we don't know for sure. I still got 10,000 remains sitting at the University of Indianapolis. We believe there's as many as 25 or more people that are represented in those remains. The fact that he did die early on in the investigation that kind of focused things really away from him. The FBI continued putting the pieces together after Baumeister died, and by 1998 confirmed that he was responsible for killing some of the men and boys found dead in rural areas. Tonight, the case is closed on nine more victims, all believed to have had deadly encounters with Herbert Baumeister between 1980 and 1990. Police have had a witness for 15 years. He helped draw this sketch in 1983. Now police believe the man in the sketch is Herbert Baumeister, and the man with whom he left the Vogue Theater in May 1983 is Michael Riley, another victim. Will we ever know? Will this investigation ever end? I don't know. Next, the one simple action that could move the Baumeister investigation into its final chapter. And it's a move you can make. his voice. I could still hear him. I just hope nobody ever has to experience that, you know, um, the unknown is really terrible. There is danger in the unknown. It's the very reason why Debbie Falls believes people need to know what happened to her brother and to other innocent men. I think people need to know that there was this serial killer. It is part of our gay history. It's a, it's a horrible chapter and not something to just flip the pages and gloss over and go on. This is a piece of history. This is most likely the largest mass murder, at least in this state, if not in the Midwest. People need to be careful, and they need to, just because somebody's nice to you, that don't make them your friend. Don't go with these people. You don't know what people are capable of doing. I'm a firm believer history repeats itself. It may not be the exact same time period, won't be the exact same person, but history repeats, and it can happen again. It's not just a couple deceased individuals. It's many individuals. I, I think that's worth telling the story, because these people deserve to have their story told. The search for bones and bodies has drawn interest from police agencies from across the state and the country. And it has drawn interest from Indianapolis police, who have more than 100 active missing persons cases. When Baumeister died, shortly after that, everything came to a stop. It was a different climate in the middle 90s. Um, I think some people looked at this in this county, in Hamilton County, conservative Hamilton County, and said, suspect's dead. These are gay men from Indianapolis. Why should we do any more? We're learning more about the process to identify the remains of more than a dozen people found 26 years ago on the former property of a notorious serial killer. No longer forgotten. That sign hangs there for a reason. It's to remind us every day that these remains are people. And for 26 years, nobody did anything. They were forgotten. That's, that's not right. I, as a sister, I 
cried really hard for my brother, but I watched my mom, and that's why I keep saying, it's gonna be good news for the mothers that are still alive because this has been 30 years. My mom had to pay, you know, to get, you know, some of the bones tested to find what were of my brothers um, so we could bury him. And there was people in there with brown bags that didn't have nobody picking them up. Closure for two sisters years after their brothers disappeared. It's not enough to stop their grief, bring back their loved ones, or answer the unknown questions surrounding Herbert Baumeister. But our questions now focus on the unnamed victims. Who were they? Do their families have the closure they need? Even if you don't want to take the remains and bury them, even if you don't want to have anything to do with the whole situation, just know and let the person be identified. Don't be a John Doe. Because I could have a friend there and not know it. It's really important that any family members that had a loved one go missing in the 80s and 90s provide family reference samples. If we do not have family members of people that were missing during that time come forward, our investigation is going to come to a halt pretty quickly. We have to have comparison samples. We need to make sure that we are attempting to identify every fragment in order to identify every individual and be able to provide as much of that individual as we can for the family members to have some closure. I hope they get at least peace of knowing that they have something of their loved ones. I think they need to go home. I think that um, there's mothers like my mom that has went to heaven and have found their child there, but the ones that are still here need their babies home.